The world's problems can seem insurmountable in a deeply individualistic society like ours, but perhaps together, as communities, our worries and their causes could be conquered. The philosopher and theologian, the Roman Catholic Jean Vanier, has made it his life's work to prove that point, creating communes for the learning impaired to overcome their disabilities. It's called L'Arche, or the Ark, and there are now more than 147 of them in 35 countries around the world. A new and critically acclaimed documentary, Summer in the Forest, focuses on the Paris Commune. Here's a little look. We began with no plan. It was crazy. The idea of rejecting all authority and starting to live together. <laughs> I knew nothing about this world of people with disability. As you laugh together, barriers drop. So what are your projects, André? It's a better plan for a couple. That's super. It's true? Yes. You pay me, then? Yes. Vanier is a French-Canadian. He's a former British Navy officer, and he's made his home in France for decades. And from there, we discussed his life and how we can all learn and benefit from his extraordinary experiment in being, well, just human. Jean Vanier, welcome to our program, and thanks for allowing us into your home. It looks very cozy over there. Well, I, I'm really happy. I'm happy that you're there, and... Uh... I'm in my home and it's great here. Well, you know what? You have given happiness and joy to the world. And that, I think, is your special gift. And I just want you to take us back, you know, more than 50 years when you first had the idea to set up the Arche, the Ark, in so many different communities. What was the spark? I have a story like everybody has a story. I mean, I was in the British Navy. I left the Navy. I resigned from the Navy. Uh, to follow Jesus. And then I met a priest, and he was then a chaplain at a home for people with disabilities. I began looking into the situation of people with disabilities in France. I spoke to parents. I went to psychiatric hospitals, and uh, eventually I was in an institution where there were 80 men with disabilities, and... Uh, I was very moved by them. There was something so beautiful and so painful. I felt uh, deep in my heart I wanted to do something. And so I just welcomed two men and we started living together. Raphael had had a meningitis. He spoke a few words. He was the same age as myself, approximately. And then there was Philippe. And Philippe spoke a lot, maybe a bit too much. And he had had an encephalitis with one leg uh, paralyzed. And so, and so we began to live together. It was just super because for these men, it was, it was home. It was freedom. And for me, it was the end of a journey and the beginning of a journey. Um, what shocked me, and it probably shocked you as well, is that that institution was essentially called a place for idiots, right? I mean, that was the official terminology that they used for these institutions. Right, and you right, could see right, beyond right. that to the human spirit, the human, you know, mind. Yeah, I mean, that's some part of my belief that every person is precious. And it became more confirmed as I lived with Raphael and Philip. You see that in each person, and I sense this deeply with Raphael and Philip, in each person, there's a sort of primal innocence, something very beautiful. But this primal innocence gets quickly covered up, covered up because we've been hurt and we have to defend ourselves or we become depressed or we get angry and, and so, or we have to defend. But behind all that, at the very heart of every human person, there's this primal innocence. I, I want to ask you about this because in many sort of social services, people, the government types thought, well, listen, if people with disabilities are able to live on their own, you know, let's give them an apartment, let's treat them with dignity. 
But you quickly found out that that's not exactly what they wanted, right? They actually wanted to live in group homes. Yes, well, uh, to begin with, even in 1970, we had started little apartments in Kompyeng, 10 kilometers from here, and they found work. But then we found that some were becoming alcoholic because they were looking at television, drinking beers. And so then we had to help them enter into AA and so on. <laughs> because really what they wanted also is to have places of heartfelt friendship where they could find their place, where they could find a certain inner freedom and so on. Because the world is not just work, it is also relationship, meeting people. That's such a basic human instinct that you describe. And it's really important to, you know, to focus on, on it right now, how to be human. I just wonder what you learned from your own parents. Your father uh, helped to liberate the concentration camp at Buchenwald. Your mother worked for the Red Cross and did a lot with refugees in World War II. And you, of course, were, were in the Navy. What did you learn from them at a very early age? The love which I received in the family, uh, their faith, because mum and dad were really men also of faith. And dad was a man, and both of them, mum and dad, both of them with great integrity. And dad, though, uh, he was in the army and then he went into the diplomatic and then, of course, he became the governor general of Canada, but he was never a politician. He hadn't, didn't struggle. He was a humble man. And I think as I think of my dad, his humility and his goodness, mm -hmm. and that mum the same, they were a beautiful team together. And just finally, I just want you to reflect on meeting the Queen of England. Uh, you, uh, as a young naval cadet, met the Queen when you were very, very young, and she was young, and you met again uh, not so long ago. T tell me, walk me through that. Well, in the vanguard, which was the battleship which took uh, her parents uh, to South Africa in 1947, it's true that we met, and I was a young officer, a young midshipman at that time, and we had fun together, and, you know, it was... And actually, she had her... 21st birthday in Durban, and uh, so I was invited, like many of the other officers, to this to this part. But then I had the chance to meet the Queen recently. Did she remember you? Did she remember me? Well, yes. You know, my dad, you see, had been also Governor General of Canada, so and he was representing her. I was deeply touched as I entered her sitting room. She walked to me instead of me walking to her, but I was. She looked at me and she just said, hello, Jock. Now, Jock was what the name I had when I was a little child, because I had a nanny who was Scottish, and the Queen came up and she said, hello, Jock. She is a beautiful woman of deep interiority. I, I was amazed and touched by the quality of, of that woman. It's a wonderful story. Jean Vanier, thank you for sharing that with us. I just want to thank you, and I thank you there because you saw the film, and the film is important, but what is important are the people there. I'm just lucky to be nearly 90, living in this community with beautiful people and helped in every way, and. So I just want to, you know, it's just great to, to help people discover if we can lower our barriers and meet them, the world will change and we will move to peace. Wow, well, that's a great thought to end with. Jean Vanier, thank you so much indeed. Bless you and be well. Thank you. Thank you for being there. It's an important and timely message of compassion and empathy.